do we expect the police to be honest? Do they have to be? I'm Dan Ringer, and we'll talk about police corruption right now on The Law Works. From West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Closed captioning for The Law Works is made possible by a grant from the Monongalia County Bar Association to support legal information and education for all West Virginians. The Law Works is made possible by major grants from the West Virginia Attorney General and from Software Systems Incorporated, a West Virginia company established in 1975 which provides high-end support services, programming, and consulting for county government AS400 mid-range computer systems as well as PC-based systems, and by a grant from the West Virginia Bar Foundation. The West Virginia Bar Foundation, the philanthropic organization for West Virginia's legal profession and justice system, promoting public knowledge of the law in West Virginia. Police officers can lie, and they do, and it's okay, sometimes. But when and where is important. My guest is former West Virginia uh, Supreme Court Justice, Chief Justice Richard Neely. Richard, thank you for joining us again. Well, I'm very glad to be here. I don't think it's ever appropriate for police officers to lie unless it's to their wife about where they were last night. <laughs> Well, I'll give you an example of, of when police officers lie and it has been held to be permissible. When they are interrogating a suspect, they can distort what the evidence that they have is. They can distort what other people have said. I say distort. They can lie about what somebody else has said in an effort to elicit a confession or at least unfortunate language well, from the uh, that, suspect. That, we call that a ruse, not a lie. <laughs> a convenient term. A convenient term. Uh, so, so is police corruption, police lying, is it a problem? It's a terrible problem. It, it really is. And it's... The, the problem with law is that you hardly ever have a situation of right and wrong. What you usually have is a situation of right and right. You, you, you have to choose perhaps either the lesser of two evils, you know, or the the better of two goods, but the, the police do a lot of very valuable things. And the police are very important for any one of a number of reasons, but public safety is the first. Also, police are often heroes. I mean, the police will run into burning buildings and pull people out. Police will get into firefights with thugs and at the risk of their own lives. I think that a lot of car stops, particularly with police who are alone in a patrol car, require a certain amount of courage and putting your life on the line. So the things that I say about the police don't ignore the very heroic functions that the police perform. But the temptation to illegal activity on the part of the police is almost irresistible. I am a, a watcher of cop programs. I mean, I like nice shoot 'em up you know, Chicago PD, Blue Bloods, you know, all the, if, if it's a cop program on television, I probably watch Horrible it. Horrible cases that can be resolved in 60 minutes. Right, exactly. But the, the, the interesting thing is that it, it invariably, in all of those programs, the bad guys are internal affairs, the rat squad, the people who are trying to supervise the police. And the truth of the matter is that internal affairs and the supervision of the police is very important. In West Virginia, the very worst police are in small towns. These are, these are police officers who are not at all well paid sometimes making as little as nine dollars an hour. Uh, they are not well trained. There's a West Virginia statute that requires them to have had 
some number of weeks at the state police academy, not anywhere near the number of weeks that the state police get. They, have, they are required to have some watered down state police academy training, but not for some probationary period of six months or so. So you have a lot of people serving as police officers on a probationary basis who have not yet gone through the academy. And, uh, and in small towns, there is just a lot of extortion on the part of police officers. I have seen uh, police officers extorting business owners and indicating that, well, if you don't pay up, why we're going to arrest people coming out of your restaurant or your bar or your shop. Um, I, I've seen that in one of the towns up the river from Charleston. What capacity uh, did you see that in? Uh, I, I saw that actually as a lawyer. Um, I saw that uh, the, the, the person who was extorted was not a client of mine, but uh, she was a client of my partner, Mike Callahan, who used to be head of the criminal division in the U.S. Attorney's Office. I mean, he's a very fine criminal lawyer. And uh, I have seen other instances, for example, in the town of Clendenin about 10 years ago, there was a mayor who simply wrote out blank commitment forms to commit people to jail. The mayor in many small towns is also the city judge. Now, bigger towns have a professional city judge. For example, Charleston has an elected city judge who performs the function of, of the city magistrate. But in small towns, the mayor is ex officio the city judge. He may write out a, a, a commitment upon probable cause and upon a hearing with the defendant he can decide that the defendant should go to the regional jail. And that requires an affidavit from the police officer who says, here is what I observed or what I found out through investigation. Correct. And so this mayor in Clendenin simply signed blank commitment forms which allowed any police officer in Clendenin to take a, a, a defendant whom he didn't like, arrest him at, say, 5 o'clock on Friday afternoon, and make sure that he was going to spend the entire weekend in jail. And th this, is, this is pervasive behavior. Um, and it's not limited to small town cops. Although in my experience, the larger the police force, the more professional the police force. The, the, larger, the lar larger sheriff's offices, the state police are substantially more professional than small towns. And that's because you have more people watching. It's sort of the same rule that you have with investment. If you invest in a big company like, like Exxon or Colgate Palmolive or IBM, there is less likelihood that management will steal the money and go south with it. Now, if you invest in a startup company, it's possible for the chief executive officer to just take all the cash and go to Miami, you know, with a six pack of Jack Daniels and, you know, and a suitcase full of money. Or a Bernie Madoff, who or, 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 all your friends invest with him, right. and he's just him and a couple of other accomplices. Right, exactly. I mean, you can, whereas, whereas, a, a, whereas Morgan Stanley, Morgan Stanley has lots of people watching everybody at Morgan Stanley. It's actually quite annoying. They have a, a, an integrity division that's always asking for this piece of paper or that piece of paper, but a big bureaucracy tends to be uh, uh, a lot less threatening than a small town where there's nobody watching. But at the same time, perhaps one of the worst examples of the lying police officer, police corruption, was with the West Virginia State Police. It's true, and that was the, the famous Zane case, but I'll give you an even better one. Uh, there was a corrupt circuit judge in Mingo County who was already pled guilty to a federal felony. He had a state policeman as an accomplice, and what he wanted to do was to get the husband of a woman he wanted to seduce out of the way. And so the state cop concocted a felony charge and arrested this man. And about two weeks ago, I deposed this cop. 
this police, this state police officer. And I said, did you lie in front of the grand jury about the activities of Robert Woodford, Woodruff? He said, I declined to answer on the grounds that it might incriminate me. I, I said, did you file a false affidavit in front of a magistrate? I declined to answer on the grounds that it might tend to incriminate me. This officer took the Fifth Amendment on every single question that he was asked, and he has since resigned from the state police. But he's allowed to do that. Why would you hold that against him? Why is he allowed to do that? I mean, he's not allowed to, to, to lie to the grand jury. Isn't he allowed to protect himself from being prosecuted? Oh, he's, using oh, his oh, own he's words? always allowed to take the Fifth Amendment. But in a civil case, if you take the Fifth Amendment, it can be construed against you as if you had testified unfavorably uh, uh, to yourself. And, the, and that's the difference. This was right. not a criminal case. It was case. not a criminal case. This is a civil case. And in a civil case, uh, if you take the Fifth Amendment, there's a jury instruction in this state that says that the jury may infer from the witness taking the Fifth Amendment that the answer that he would have given would have been unfavorable to him. We're talking about police corruption. My guest is former West Virginia Supreme Court Chief Justice Richard Neely. I'm Dan Ringer, and this is The Law Works. Is that a unique situation? It, it's, it, it tends to be less prevalent in the state police, but I recently had a case involving the city of Milton where, uh, uh, where there was a corrupt magistrate in I say corrupt. I think maybe she was just absolutely the stupidest person to serve as magistrate since time out of mind. In any event, she was a magistrate who the testimony in this case showed regularly simply rubber stamped whatever the cops brought to her. And so she issued a warrant on no reasonable probable cause for the arrest of somebody who had run afoul of the city of Milton's established order. She protested the construction of a skateboard park right next to her house because the jumping up and down on the metal ramps uh, with the skateboard kept her up all day long and, and into 10 or 11 o'clock at night. She had three young children under seven years old. So because she protested, they decided they were going to punish her and they just concocted a case against her of assault when all she did was go into the skate park and ask some workers what they were doing. And the workers said that. When I deposed the workers, they said she never assaulted us. She never said anything hostile. She never raised her voice. She never did anything threatening. All she did was bang a piece of metal down on a piece of skate park that they were working on to test the noise level. And somebody characterized that as, as an, assault. an assault. The cops had written statements that showed that she didn't, didn't commit an assault. They went to this magistrate, who, by the way, I made a complaint uh, against to the Judicial Inquiry Commission, and she resigned rather than file an answer. She just resigned as a magistrate. We, we probably ought to clarify that the crime of assault means that you deliberately take an action that is designed to put someone else in fear of injury or some sort of harm. Right. Doesn't have, you don't have to touch them. That's the crime of battery if you touch them. You just have to make them afraid of you right. or what you might do. Yeah, and threatening, you know, uh, um, I mean, you can do it without, without a weapon or with a weapon or however. Yeah, if, I, if I pick up a pen and say, Richard, I'm going to come over and punch you with right. this, that's an assault. That's an assault. If you believe it. If you believe it. And, and so the... But, but it was a whole system. And actually, the Circuit Court of Cabell County was no better. The Circuit Court of Cabell County threw the suit on behalf of this woman out on utterly frivolous grounds. And there was no redress. You see, you, you, it is so expensive in law to vindicate your rights when you are the victim of one of these of one of these corrupt actions. And here are two little cops from the city of Milton and a so-called chief who descend on a middle-class housewife with three children under seven at home, put her in handcuffs, refuse to let her call her lawyer, 
which he demanded to do, take her to the station, take her mugshot and fingerprint her, and still refuse to allow her to call her lawyer, is absolutely contrary to the state law absolutely contrary to the magistrate handbook, absolutely contrary to the cases decided by the West Virginia Supreme Court. And then take her to a magistrate in Cabell County who puts her out on 30,000, let's see, I guess on $15,000 cash bond, or $15,000 bond, which would require her to come up with $1,500 in cash if she can find somebody and to there was the no one there who had fifteen hundred dollars in cash finally uh... some friend of hers came with a cell phone and she then they called my office and i sent one of my associates to get her out of jail the magistrate absolutely failed to read the material from the magistrate handbook absolutely failed to inquire into whether she was a flight risk deliberately to punish her wanted her to stay in jail at least overnight and perhaps for two days. Now this was a concocted, deliberate effort on the part of the city of Milton to punish an utterly innocent person and people get away with that all the time. And they wouldn't have gotten away with it in the city of Milton if they hadn't had a circuit judge who was somehow influenced by the people in power in Cabell County, namely the park board, you know, and the mayor and the police, to grant a summary judgment on the most frivolous of possible grounds against her. We're talking about police corruption. My guest is former West Virginia Supreme Court Chief Justice Richard Neely. I'm Dan Ringer, and this is The Law Works. Is this a pending case that you're involved in? It's, I mean, it's a pending case, and if we go to the West Virginia Supreme Court, the problem for people is that ordinary people can't afford to hire a lawyer, not necessarily a lawyer like me, because it's obvious I'm fairly expensive because I'm old. But you know, <laughs> it's it's but but a a the, the the woman in question happened to be married to somebody who owns a major business in West Virginia, and I'm the lawyer for that company. Um, but the the ordinary person cannot find a lawyer to vindicate his or her rights when he's worked over or she's worked over by the cops. And so although in principle a person has certain rights, in reality it is virtually impossible unless you are rich to vindicate those rights. The mistake that I made was not going to federal court because as it turned out you didn't get an honest count even in the circuit court of, Kanawha County, of uh, Cabell County. Um, had I to do it over again, I would have gone to federal court where I might have gotten a more neutral judge. And, it, and the basis for going to federal court would be what in that case? Oh, it would have been a, a civil rights violation in 1942 U.S.C. 1983, um, the, the civil rights statute. But it's expensive to go to federal court. It's much more expensive to go to federal court than to go to state court because federal court wants everything done in writing. Well, it's, it's important that we point out that I think a majority, perhaps nearly all, police officers intend to do the right thing. They may shade some things sometimes in order to elicit a confession, uh, a ruse perhaps you would mm -hmm. call it, uh, but they are properly motivated. But I have, I have actually seen in my practice over 36 years, police officers lie about major things such as you were describing but also trivial things about whether they could see a stoplight to determine if somebody had run through it in a, in a minor traffic ticket matter. I found that one out by going to the scene of the uh, citation after the case was over, standing there and realizing you can't see that light from this position, which I, yeah, yeah, that's such a trivial thing, but the police officer apparently simply did not like the person he had ticketed. I think that police officers lie all the time and that jurors need to be conscious of the fact that police officers have an interest in convicting people whom they've arrested. The, the notion that somehow a police officer is neutral and has no incentive to lie just doesn't bear out in practice. Now, often police officers are telling the truth, but I think that jurors have to receive testimony from police officers 
with the same reservation that they receive testimony from defendants and from defendants' alibi witnesses and from everybody else in court, that one has to be a bit searching with regard to the testimony of the police concerning uh, what they've seen or, uh, or what happened uh, or how the defendant was apprehended, et cetera. Because I think that, but I'm mainly concerned about about the level of civil rights violations that occurs in small towns where it's like Milton where nobody is minding the store where you have a mayor who is not at all competent and you have a, a whole bunch of old boys who are getting together to organize things within the town and there is no check or balance whatsoever in a town like Milton uh, or, in, or in a town like Clendenin, or, and I, I mention these southern towns because they're the ones where I have clients who've actually had the experiences. Your experiences have been in the north. To, yes, that, right. that's correct. And, and one that sort of haunts me to this day is I was serving as an assistant prosecuting attorney, and I got a phone call about 2 o'clock in the morning one night, and it was a police officer that I knew on the other end of the phone, and he said, here is what happened, and he described a crime that had committed. It was a stick-up, uh, and he described how the police figured out who it was they wanted to go talk to, uh, and they went and they knocked on the door and went through the door and arrested the guy right there. No warrant of any kind, search warrant, arrest warrant, nothing. They said, uh, is that okay? And I said, no, no, that's not okay. You, we cannot prosecute that case. And the officer said, well, wait a minute, I wasn't really there. It was somebody else who did this. Let me check with him. Called me back 20 minutes later. He said, okay, I talked with the guy who did this, and here's what really happened. He described another scenario. He said, how's that? I said, no, that's still imperfect. That's still not right. You can't do it. And he said, well, let me check back and make sure that the guy I talked to was really the guy that did it. It may have been somebody else who did it. And he went through three or four iterations of this until finally he described a scenario and he said, now how's that? And I said, yeah, if that's what really happened, that would be good enough. And sure as shooting, they arrested and prosecuted the guy under the third or fourth scenario of the crime arrest. I think that's, I think that's very common. I'll give you one more example. The town of Hurricane has decided to set up a revenue speed tra trap on I-64. Now, the town of Hurricane has no interest whatsoever in I-64. These are people who are going from somewhere else to somewhere else. It doesn't go through the town of Hurricane except, except, uh, well, except theoretically because it's a closed road. It doesn't have anything to do with traffic. But it crosses Hurricane. over the property. The, of the, the reason that it's really illegal for the town of Hurricane to do this is it violates something called Tummy versus Ohio. It's a Supreme Court case that says that you can't have people who are financially interested in a case making decisions about the guilt or innocence of folks. It, it was on that case, by the way, that we struck down the old Justice of the Peace system in West Virginia. If you take the state police or the city police, they are going to be fairly objective and apply discretion to whether to arrest or give a ticket, et cetera. When you have a revenue speed trap, the only object of it is to collect money. There is no integrity to it at all, and there is no use of discretion. It is strictly set up to generate money from people who happen to be passing through. Now, if that becomes prevalent in West Virginia among all the small towns that border the interstate, Perhaps the legislature would, would act if enough people were outraged. I, I could go to the West Virginia Supreme Court with a writ of prohibition. I just don't feel like spending the time and effort. Uh, I mean, it just requires a lot of time and a lot of, of, of what otherwise would be income-producing work. And for some unfortunate client, a lot of money. Right. And if, if a client wanted to do it, it would take a lot of money. Richard Neely, thank you very much, Richard, for being with us again. <laughs> Always love it. Thank you also for being with us. On behalf of the Law Works, I'm Dan Ringer. Good evening. 
If you would like to suggest a topic for a future The Law Works show, or if you're a school teacher and would like to receive a DVD of this show for classroom use, send us an email to thelawworks at comcast.net or visit us on Facebook. On the LawWorks website at thelawworks.org, you'll find a listing of recent The Law Works programs, additional information about this show's topic, and video of this and recent shows. You can also find The Law Works programs on YouTube and iTunes. The Law Works is produced in cooperation with the Office of the West Virginia Attorney General, the West Virginia Bar Foundation, the Mountain State Bar, the Monongahela County Bar Association, and the West Virginia University College of Law. The Law Works is made possible by major grants from the West Virginia Attorney General and from Software Systems Incorporated, a West Virginia company established in 1975 which provides high-end support services, programming, and consulting for county government AS400 mid-range computer systems as well as PC-based systems, and by a grant from the West Virginia Bar Foundation. The West Virginia Bar Foundation the philanthropic organization for West Virginia's legal profession and justice system, promoting public knowledge of the law in West Virginia. Additional support for the law works is provided by the West Virginia Supreme Court of Appeals. From West Virginia Public Broadcasting, 